Um, right, OK, this is the uh, annual lecture given to first years on the Marmot Report. Um, I'm doing this form for a couple of reasons. One, because there's quite a lot of technical details, which frankly it's easier for me to read off notes um, rather than try to memorise them. Uh, and also so it's available for second and third years and anyone else who's tuning in. Um, this is on YouTube, so people may come across it. It's a pretty dry subject, but uh, I would suggest a very important subject. Uh, so we're going to talk about, we're going to have a brief discussion of the history of UK public health reports, uh, talk about the Marmot report, and have a little bit of reminders about things like super output areas. Um, since the election there's been a number of important changes to public health in the UK and England in particular, uh, we're going to talk about them, one of them being the transfer of a lot of these responsibilities to local authorities and also the responsibility to deal with the food industry. Then we'll go back to Marmot's uh, update, which it does every year, and have a look at some of the latest local data, which you will find fairly depressing. OK, um, it's easy to be cynical about the last 30 years of UK public health reports. Uh, several have come and gone, many might say without greatly impacting on public health policy. And I have to confess that this section was originally called File in the Bin. That's a little bit unfair. Um, Black Report probably started all this. It was commissioned by the then Labour government in the late 1970s. Uh, however, when Mrs Thatcher's Conservatives won the 1979 general election, they delayed publication until 1980, when the report was released on an August bank holiday, with only 260 copies made on, available on the day for the press. Uh, this was long before the internet, of course. If you wanted copies of a report like this, you had to get a physical copy of the report. And the Black Report went away, let's be fair, uh, but it was the inspiration for policies developed by both the Office of Economic Cooperation and Development and the World Health Organization. Uh, and it has had a lasting effect, even if not an immediate effect on UK government policy. Uh, ultimately, the, argues that the ar arguments that were in Black and were developed by OECD and WHO developed public health in the UK approach, including Marmot. Uh, we'll just have a, a little look at the OECD's website. Um, I always like the fact that there's lots of information available covering lots of different aspects. So if you're interested in this area, internationally as well as nationally, uh, the OECD website's well worth having a look at. Um, it's a bit hard to track down information either the Whitehead or Atchison reports. Uh, if you read sources like Wikipedia, it seems they were not acted on, and now only of historical interest. That's not entirely true, which is another reason why you shouldn't rely on sources like Wikipedia. Such reports do shape policy, even if they aren't fully acted on. Um, following another change of government, uh, the Food Policy Eradication Bill was enacted in 2002, um, as a consequence of Atchison and various other reports. This bill involved the development of food policy, food poverty eradication strategies at both local and national level. OK, so 30 years after Black, we come to the Marmot Report, the one that has changed things. Uh, the report starts with a, uh, a quote here talking about people on low incomes uh, skipping meals often for a whole day. And the first line I think of the report is this from the Peruvian port, Pablo Neruda. Rise up with me against the organisation of misery. Uh, a noble sentiment. Um, a 242 pages of reports, comprehensive. Uh, for a quick overview, we can read the much short executive summary, drilling at the details of the main report when you need to. Uh, the lead author was, author was Sir Michael Marmot. Obviously, many other people were involved, but for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to call it the Marmot Report. Uh, when I say Marmot said this, when I said Marmot said that, I'm of course referring to the whole team and all the people who have contributed over a number of years. Responding to increasing concerns about these persistent and widening inequalities, the WHO, the World Health Organization, established its Commission on Social Determinants of Health in 2005. The idea was to provide advice on how to reduce uh, these inequalities. The Commission's final report was launched in August 2008 and contained these three overarching recommendations. Um, improve daily living conditions, tackle the inequitable distribution of power, money and resources, and measure and understand the problem and assess the impact of action. Uh, I'll leave you to consider how far we've developed on these, um, especially perhaps number two. 
Again, World Health Organization has a good website, well worth having a look at, and that's the link to their social determinants of health information. So if you're interested in this, not just uh, nationally but globally, this is another one of the places to look. Um, the Commission argued that at least 200 million children worldwide are not achieving their full potential and call for equality, uh, equity rather, from the start of life, a, a, a theme very much taken up by Marmot, better living environment and fair employment policies, among a range of other laudable ambitions. Um, although the World Health Organization is the mandated leader in world health, it does recognize that delivering these goals is a multilateral approach, um, requiring national local government involvement and a range of other participants, which is one of the big changes recently in public health in the UK. Uh, this rally crawls an impetus for the commissioning of the Marmot Report by the Department of Health, who concluded that worldwide social injustice is killing on a grand scale. There is a social gradient in health. This is a key finding of the Marmot Report. Social position affects health outcomes, adversely so for those with low socioeconomic status. In order to deal with the consequences of these inequalities, Marmot recommends positive action should be taken to reduce the social gradient in health. And here's a graph which, which illustrates this very well. Um, okay, we'll have a look what the graph says before I talk about this. Up the up this side is the age at which people, uh, the uh, people's age. Uh, along here is neighbourhood income income deprivation measures. The people over here are the most deprived. People over here are the least deprived. So if we look at this line, which is involved in life expectancy, there is a clear increase in life expectancy between people who are the most deprived and people who are the least deprived. Uh, all these dots indicate evidence, and the line through it is the best line of best fit. Uh, the line below talks about something called disability-free life expectancies. That is to say, how long you can expect uh, to be able to work, for example, to be able to travel easily. And again, there is a social gradient. Uh, people in the most deprived areas, the early 50s, this starts to be a major problem. People in the least deprived areas um, between the ages of 60 and 70. Uh, now, I've imposed another line on here, this big thick line here which is the proposals for increase in the pension age and you'll notice the people in the most uh, people in terms of disability free life expectancy changes of the increase of the pension pension age are clearly going to impact on a lot of people uh, but for now we'll just look at uh, the differences between the two groups in a slightly more methodical way so looking at uh, life expectancy I'll put in a little line there showing the difference and if you work it out it's about seven years seven or eight years difference in life expectancy between people at the top of the income scale if you like and people at the bottom of the income scale if you look at disability free life expectancy it's even more marked there is a 17 year difference in England people living in the poorest neighborhoods will on average die seven years earlier than those living in the richest neighborhoods um, also, the average difference in disability-free life expectancy is 17 years. Uh, the Marmot authors say we can draw similar graphs, classifying individuals not only where, by where they live, but their level of education, their occupation, their housing conditions. And we see similar gradients. Put simply, the higher one's social position is, the better one's health is likely to be. And as I mentioned, the difference is even starker for disability-free life expectancy. Uh, quoting again, people living in poor areas not only die sooner, but they also spend more of their shorter lives with a disability. Okay, moving on to education. Um, this is the percentage of pupils achieving five A star to C grades in English and Maths at GCSE. Again, by income, de income de deprivation. Most deprived over here, least deprived over here. And there's clearly a social gradient in health. Um, on these pages, I should mention, I've put the original Marmot report or where it is the executive summary. I've, I've indicated that as well. Uh, this one's a bit more complicated. Uh, when Marmot first came out, this is one of the graphs that got the most attention. I, I remember it was featured quite heavily in New Scientist, among other places. Um, one of the key points made by the report is that inequality starts at birth, or even earlier, as we'll discuss briefly later in the context of epigenetics, and accumulates through life. Uh, these graphs are particularly telling, and some people have said quite shocking, evidence to support this, this view. Uh, Q. 
and a Q is basically a measure of the cognitive development of a child. The higher the value, the more cognitively developed the child is. The darker lines here, uh, these ones here and these ones here, are from children from relatively high socioeconomic backgrounds. The lighter lines, that one and that one, are from children from uh, less well-off backgrounds. Okay, if we if we look at this one first, uh, children with a high Q score at 22 months and from relative well-off backgrounds continue to do relatively well. When compared to children from less well-off backgrounds, you can see the gap there widening, widening quite considerably between those two lines after being quite narrow here. Um, similarly, going the other way, um, from from almost the start, the gap continues to widen. So people from children rather from a higher socioeconomic background have better outcomes which are narrowing for the ones that started off better whereas the ones from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are just living out basically and not really progressing. Um, so the evidence suggests that children of educated or wealthy parents can score poorly in early tests but still catch up whereas children of worse off parents are extremely unlikely to do so. Um, and sadly, there's no evidence that entry into school and reverses this pattern. Okay, I'm going to pause there because I'm getting near the 15-minute limit for YouTube, and we'll be back shortly with slide 15.